Yeah. Uh, in 1978, my wife and I, Louise and I, started uh, a community for these kids in New Hampshire. It's still there. It's the Indian Center Children's Village. We later built a school there called the Hunter School. And uh, you know, I, I did that for five years. I was executive director. Louise was the program director. And uh, based on that and some other classes or whatever, <laughs> you know, I became an NLP trainer and a bunch of other things, and uh, then was rostered in the state of Vermont as a second therapist. I never practiced. It was just a kind of useful thing to have for the, for the work that I was doing at that point in time as a professional. So I don't, I don't generally represent myself as a second therapist. Do you find that useful and enriching in some way in the work that you do? I learned a lot about human nature, about the good side and the, the office side, why these kids ended up in care, uh, running that program, and, and working with everybody from their, their parents to social workers and the system. I mean, I learned about the system. It was a real education. We were in our 20s when we started this program in 1970. And uh, so, yeah, I'd say a lot of my worldview has been informed by that. Yeah, you know, interesting. I was wondering exactly that thing, the yeah. your, your perspective. Yeah, um, I also wondered how, what what criteria do you use when you pick guests for your show? Typically, we look at one of three things. Usually, uh, because I I do media for a living, I can usually present a topic. Um, as well as or better than somebody who's just informed about the topic. So, you know, if we're going to talk about taxes or something, I'll just do it myself and I'll just go off on it. Um, so, with the guests, the guests that I'm looking for are guests who can speak with an authority that I don't have. Somebody who's been someplace or done something. Or experience, you know, somebody who just got arrested at an occupied somebody who's helped organize something or somebody who's got themselves elected a public office or you know if we're going to talk about the process um, I'm not interested in suck up interviews with big data politicians it's one of the things I just generally don't do on my show um, so on the one hand people who can inform me who know something I don't know or who have a, 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 a voice that I can't claim you know, uh, stature. Stature is almost the wrong word. An experience of some kind that, that, that will help inform the users. Or two, somebody who just strongly disagrees with me. I, ha I regularly have conservatives on the program, libertarians, or right wing crazies, or all of the above. And the reason why is because I think that, in addition to, you know, there's always got to be an entertainment component to the media. People slow down for fistfights and car wrecks. So there's, there's, there's that piece that draws uh, attention. Yeah. Right. Um, but, but but I think even more important is what happens is instead of just ranting about my shtick, by letting them rant about their shtick and then arguing rationally, I, I don't, we don't, we don't, I don't do name calling. Engage them? It's not. I'm not so concerned about engaging them because it's very rare that I change their minds. In fact, very often they're paid to say what they say. Um, but all of my listeners and viewers get an opportunity to see both sides of the argument and to hear our side being pushed back against. If they watch me press on, morning, on Sunday morning, they're going to see right-wing senators and congressmen come on and, and say god-awful things and you know about everything from the Occupy movement to the president with no rebuttal at all. And so what I'm doing is I'm modeling how to talk back to these people how, and, and how to do it so that there's not a lot of the floor. You know, how do you have an argument with your brother-in-law for Thanksgiving dinner and still is your brother-in-law? Uh, how, do you, how do you talk with, with the person working in the next cubicle or your next door neighbor and still remain friends? And, and, and how can you puncture some of the, these balloons that they put up? You know, oh, it's, uh, it's the death tax. Well, I'm sorry, no, the tax happens long after death. You know, it's a transfer of cash to the, you know, the estate tax, for example. So uh, that's the reason why I have conservatives. And I think people you, you were saying that you're not going to persuade any of these people. Um, Occasionally it, it happens, but, but I, I'm more interested in persuading the listeners and viewers than the one person is already. And for these listeners or viewers that you're modeling this, this different kind of engagement or discussion, do you think that they would be able to persuade their friends and relatives? I hear that all the time. Yeah. This is the, the, the probably the, the most common feedback that we get to the program 
is, you know, people, people emailing or blogging or posting about, you know, I just had this incredible argument with the guy that I've been working with for 12 years and I finally knew how to, you know, fill in the blank. Right? Uh, or uh, the other really common one was, I always thought I was a Republican. I've been paying attention to politics since Reagan, or I was a little kid when Reagan was president, and all I've ever known is Reaganomics, and nobody ever told me what America was like before Ronald Reagan, back when a quarter of the workforce was unionized, back when the top tax rate was 74%. Nobody questioned it. Republican presidents like Eisenhower had it at 91%, and thought it was reasonable. Right? And, 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 and they go, you know, the light bulb went off listening to your show. Now I understand, and I don't consider myself a Republican or even a conservative anymore. I've, I've learned that these people are either wrong or crazy or both. And so, which is my goal. It's to make an entertaining show that is informative and that ultimately is activist. We all have our ways of activism. You know, I used to, I, in the 60s I was in the streets. I was getting tear gassed, I got arrested, I was, you know, the whole bit. Um, that was my in the streets experience. Now it's my in the media. Now I'm occupying the media. <laughs> So you work for Ed Busters, right? I beg your pardon? Ed Busters? I don't work for them, no. I, I, wrote, a, I wrote an article for them, I don't know, six or eight years ago. Right. And I've, and I've interviewed Kelly Lassen, I believe, I believe was his name, the founder, a couple of times in the radio show. Yeah. I mean, that's the What do you think? Um, I'm a real uh, fan of George Lakoff. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. And, and you were just saying, like, death attacks, um, that way of viscerally, like, getting at people through the emotional frame of politics. And what do you say about that? How do you think that people on the on left need to, I mean, do more? Does the left need to do more of that? Yes. Yeah. yeah, we need language matters, mm -hmm. and the right has figured this out. They've got very well paid people to figure this out. And we on the left need to gain more attention to this. Um, George Lakoff has written a couple of brilliant books about this. In fact, I had him on the program just two weeks ago. He's one, of those, that, yeah. he's one of those people who can speak with authority. You know, that's beyond mine. He's a professor of this stuff. But I also wrote a book on the topic called uh, Cracking the Code, which is you know, how to deconstruct the code. And, and I think that all of us need to be learning about the text. Absolutely. I was curious if you could describe the experience of having Bernie Sanders, Senator Bernie Sanders, on the show every single week. For seven years now. For seven years. So Bernie, it was sort of when he was a congressman, we were in Vermont, we were doing the show from our living room, in fact, it might be eight years, and we wow. were doing the show from our living room in Vermont, where we started, and, and once a week, Bernie has come on, every single Friday, all these years, and there are no rules. Bernie, you know, our call screener, and if you ever call into the show, you will hear this, our call screener says, what's your name, where are you calling from, and please summarize your topic in one sentence. And that's it. And, and there's nobody who doesn't go on unless they start immediately screaming and cursing, which happens. <laughs> Our call screener says, thank you very much, and hangs up. Or they sound plastered. I mean, those are the only people we filter out. And Bernie takes on conservatives. He takes on, you know, people call up with questions. In fact, one of the things I really honor about it is people will call in with questions, and Bernie's answer is, I don't know. You know it's, it happens you know, every other week or so. Somebody will call in with a, with a question. Sometimes it's an obscure question. What do you think about HR 22? 36, or I'm not sure what you're talking about. But sometimes it's even a, a larger issue, and it's just not one that's in his realm. And he'll just say, you know, I don't know, you should ask Sherrod Brown about that. That's his area of expertise. Or something like that. But Bernie, you know, will answer anything. And, and, and that's, in my mind, the definition of a genuine statesman. You know, not just a politician, but a statesman. And, and we need more like that. You know, it's, just, it's a national town hall meeting once a week for seven years. And I wish every member of Congress would do the same. Right, it, and they should be in their districts. Instead, they hide out. The theme here at We Act Radio is truth telling. Yeah. And it, I, I truly believe that Bernie Sanders' truth telling has been, in a big part, an inspiration to the Occupy movement. Bernie has to, not to only bring inspired, about. I believe, the Occupy movement and everybody else, and been a great role model. For, for all of us, but also a great role model for politicians. He's one of those forces that helps keep Congress honest to the extent that that's possible. And, right. and, and, you know, the, and, the, and the positive publicity that he gets for just being himself. I mean, 
why I said he doesn't dance around issues. He'll, he'll give you his answer, he'll give you his opinion, or he'll say, I don't know. It's pretty much it. You know, I've never heard him do this offshoot in all these years. That's such an important, powerful example to, to help move our politics in a more positive direction. I would even like to see right wingers give honest answers once in a while. Yeah. And sometimes they do if they have a genuine belief. Well, yeah, I think everybody should have a gun. You know, okay, you believe it. You know, it's, it's fine. We can have an honest conversation about it. But then you get the like the Romneys in the world too. Okay, my opinion is this, right? <laughs> yeah, when you hear a fresh answer, you go, "Whoa!" Uh, it's, it's a, you know, it pulls you over a little bit. You realize how many talking points you've been hearing all the time, and you get accustomed to it. Expect it. How do you deal with those when you, when you get somebody that's so skilled with the talking points? Well. Usually I try to deconstruct them or I'll challenge them or I'll take them on. Occasionally, I, sometimes I just lose patience. Friday I had a, a caller, actually I had like three in a row, and it was pretty clear. There's this whole make money in your spare time thing that the right wingers have, where if you can call into the radio show, you get 25 bucks. If you post a blog post, you get 25 cents. Oh yeah, a lot of those posts, like in the New York Times, if they run an article, you can comment on it. A lot of those comments, not just the New York Times, everywhere are people who are paid to, to make right wing talking points. And it's a very well-funded machine. And this one, finally, you know, after like the third one in an hour on Friday, I just, you know, I just basically hung up. I said, you know, I, I've heard this so many times. I'm, I'm out of patience for the next caller. But rarely do I do that. Usually I just do that. And one other sort of political question. Uh, Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. What do you think of her chances of winning Massachusetts? I think Elizabeth Warren is has the potential to be the next Bernie Sanders, is well, the next really genuine, honest, highly esteemed, you know, transformational politician. And I am very, very hopeful that she wins, wins that race. I'm concerned that you know when Karl Rove gets into the act and the Koch brothers get into the act, that it's going to be a real challenge. You know, Scott Brown has got a lot of Wall Street money behind him, a lot more to come. Everybody needs to, if they have the ability, to help out with some and, and you know, the campaign is looking for five dollar donations. If they have the ability to help out with some more, that's an important sell seat. Yeah, I'm hoping that she wins Massachusetts and then runs in 2016 for president. She would make a kick ass president. She would, absolutely. Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>